This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. We have a quorum, so we'll go ahead and start. Uh, Ankit Bargava is our speaker this morning. He's a second year in the clinical track. He went to Emory for undergrad and then um, back to his home in Arkansas for medical school and then has been at Emory ever since for residency and uh, he's a second year in our clinical track now. So he's going to speak about cardiac MRI uh, in ischemia and uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Ankit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming for my talk. Um, so I'll be talking about cardiac MRI and its applications to ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, for objectives today, we're going to re briefly review MRI physics and image acquisition, um, and then we'll look at the applications of MRI in regards to ischemic cardiomyopathy as far as it regards to detection of coronary disease, stress perfusion imaging, and viability testing. And then we'll move on to the applications of MRI and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies especially in how they relate to diagnosis, prognosis, and guiding management. Um, so I know it's 7.30 in the morning, uh, MRI physics. I'm going to keep it very simplified and very focused. Um, the machine, we start with the main magnetic coil. This is what creates our main magnetic field known as B0. The vector of the magnetic field goes from the feet of the patient down towards the head, so it's in this z-axis over here. The magnetic field strength is measured in Teslas, and in clinical MRI, most of our machines are 1.5 Teslas, though we do have machines that also go to 3.0 Tesla. Um, in addition to the main magnetic coil, you have gradient coils, which can alter the local magnetic field in the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And then you have your radio frequency transmitter coils, which transmit radio frequency pulses that are used to alter the image and enhance different parts of tissue that you want to see on your image. The patient himself is... Uh, wearing a receiver coil, and that is used to uh, cover the area of interest. Um, MRI physics really relates to the hydrogen atom. The body is composed of 70% water along with fat, and due to that, we have an abundance of hydrogen atoms that can be manipulated with radio frequency pulses. Um, the hydrogen nucleus contains just one proton, and each proton has its own intrinsic spin. Intrinsic spin is a quantum property of the proton. It's not necessarily physically spinning. But that spin creates a magnetic vector that we call the magnetic dipole moment. And if you apply a magnetic field to it, that can cause the magnetic vector to precess, meaning that it does this rotational motion almost like a top spinning. Um, and that frequency of which it's spinning is called the Lamour frequency, which is important, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But the frequency is determined by also the magnetic field applied to it. So in our typical MRI machine, a 1.5 Tesla machine, we have a little more frequency of 64 uh, megahertz. Uh, at rest, we all have our hydrogen atoms with our vectors in various different ways, and they cancel each other out. So there's no net magnetization. But if you put a patient through a magnetic field, your hydrogen atoms then start to align either parallel or anti-parallel to that magnetic field. Most of them will be parallel, and you have net magnetization, which can then be further manipulated to create your image. Um, so this is the sequence of events. Uh, you have your hydrogen atom that's precessing in the Z axis, where your magnetic field is uh, pointing towards. And then you apply a radio frequency pulse that is the same Lamour frequency, the same precession frequency, that then causes it to go from a low energy state down to a high energy state. The hydrogen atom is then spinning in a transverse axis, and as it starts to relax, it releases energy and goes back to its uh, low energy state. And that leads us to T1 and T2 relaxation. And I will be just focusing on those for right now. Um, so you have your vector here in the z-axis. Before you apply a radio frequency pulse, you apply the pulse, it goes into the xy plane. And then as it recovers back into that z-axis, uh, the time it takes to recover 63% of those protons back in the z-axis is our time constant of T1. And T1 relates to your tissue. So water has a longer T1 time than fat. So if you measure your signal uh, at T1 of fat, you see that you have a brighter signal for fat, and your water will be dark. So in T1 images, water is dark, fat is bright. T2 relaxation is looking at, once you've applied the radio frequency pulse, all your protons are moving in a, a circle around that transverse plane, but eventually will go out of phase. The time it takes for 37% uh, to just be in phase after that is your T2 relaxation time. 
Uh, and like T1, they're also specific to the tissue. Um, so here, if water is, has a very long T2 and you measure your signal then, water will appear bright. If you go down here, your fat, while it does also have a long T2 time, it'll be dark. Um, and so this is just showing you, if you were to look at it from the XY plane, everything is first in phase, it starts spinning around, then you have a couple of protons that lag behind, some that are going forward, the vector gets weaker and weaker, and then eventually decays. Um, the simplified version of image acquisition is that once you have a change in your mag magnetic moment, it induces an electrical signal that's received by the radio frequency coil, and then the computer receives that signal, converts it to a digital signal called K-space, and from that K-space we have an image processor that can then uh, do what's called Fourier transmission to, transformation to cause your uh, MRI image to appear. If you get anything out of everything I just said, just remember that T1, water is dark, T2, water is bright. Um, if the MRI machine is our hardware, then the pulse sequences are like our software. And we can use different pulse sequences to enhance different parts of our image. Uh, and they fall into two broad categories, functional images and tissue characterization. For our functional images, we have uh, the workhorse. That's the balanced steady state free precession images. Uh, that's what gives you these nice, clear looking um, cine images. Uh, in these images, blood is bright. There's a clear delineation between the blood pool and the myocardium. There's a high temporal resolution, uh, and we gate our cardiac images so that way, in each slice, you can then match it up to the uh, other slices at the same part of the cardiac cycle. Uh, with these images, you can calculate ventricular volume, mass, function. You can also identify regional wall motion abnormalities and inspect velocity flow jets. Uh, for tissue characterization, the first one to know about is black blood imaging. This can either be T1 or T2 weighted. The blood pool is null. That just means that the blood is made dark. And this creates, again, uh, demarcation between your myocardium and the dark blood pool. In T1 weighted images, it's good for anatomical evaluation. Um, it also includes a clear depiction of the pericardium. T2 weighted images highlight areas of edema. Uh, like I said, water is bright, so if edema has a lot of fluid in it, uh, such as in states of acute ischemia, myocarditis, or sarcoidosis, these images will also appear bright. There's also first pass perfusion. Uh, we'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about that later, but we use gadolinium and um, take images about 30 seconds to two minutes after it's been injected. And it's used in stress perfusion imaging for cardiac MRI. Here you have your rest images, and you see that the myocardium lights up appropriately. On stress, you have these defects uh, that are dark, which indicate ischemia. And then we have late gadolinium enhancement, which I think is a term we all know. But to be specific about what it does, it's, it's really the, uh, its greatest role is in identifying ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. What it does is it accelerates your T1 relaxation time. And a shorter T1 means that you have increased signal on T1 images. Gadolinium does not go through the cellular membrane. It gets stuck in the extracellular space. So what you do is... When you take your gadolinium in image, you null your myocardium, making it dark, and then the areas of increased extracellular volume where the gadolinium will be stuck, such as in areas of fibrosis or edema or infiltrative processes, will appear bright. When you think about late gadolinium enhancement, it's, it's helpful to start with that before you break down into the, all your other different types of cardiomyopathies. If it's present, you look to see is it in a coronary distribution? Uh, if so, then that can mean that it's coronary artery disease, infarct, or scar. If it's in a non-coronary distribution, that gives you a hint that it might be something like myocarditis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or some other infiltrative process. We'll come back to this a little bit later. All right. So ischemic cardiomyopathies and, and cardiac magnetic resonance. Um, for the detection of coronary disease and stress imaging, uh, we have two modalities. We have dobutamine stress CMR, which is very similar to dobutamine stress echo with the same protocol of increasing dobutamine and looking for wall motion abnormalities. Uh, we also have perfusion stress CMR, which uh, is also similar to our nuclear studies, except it utilizes gadolinium contrast and the first pass perfusion that I was talking about. The big question, though, is why should we do CMR, uh, stress CMR? Um, its sensitivity and specificity are in the mid-'80s. SPECT is a little less sensitive, but about as specific as uh, stress EMR. But the real advantage is in the extra information that you can get from a cardiac magnetic resonance image. It can assess uh, more accurately your LVEF, uh, 
your regional wall motion abnormalities in FARC territory. It can simultaneously also look at viability. Uh, you can look at valvular pathologies. And from a patient perspective, uh, you know, no matter how big the patient is, if they can fit through the bore, the quality of your image will be the same. Um, there's no trouble with acoustic windows. There's no trouble with attenuation art artifacts. Uh, and in addition, MRI has no radiation. Uh, but what we use cardiac MRI more so for is for cardiac viability testing. Um, what we're interested in is hibernating myocardium, a state where there's chronic myocardial dysfunction at rest that can be partially or completely restored if you restore the blood flow. And we have three methods of looking at that with cardiac MRI. Uh, you can look at the end diastolic wall thickness. You can do a low-dose dobutamine protocol for assessment of coronary reserve. And then you can also look at the extent of late gadolinium enhancement. Um, when you look at scar formation in the ventricular wall, severe wall thinning is really the end product after you've had a transmural infarction. And that can take up to four months before it's uh, really progressed to that stage. Uh, when we look at wall thinning less than 5.5 millimeters in the end diastolic uh, phase, we consider that non-viable. Uh, and with that threshold, we have a negative predictive value of about 90%, uh, but only a 62% positive predictive value uh, if it's greater than 5.5. Uh, this is an example of a patient who had wall thinning. Uh, bottom images here are in systole. Uh, top images are here in diastole. You can see that there's wall thinning in the anteroceptal and apical and uh, anterior wall. Uh, this patient also had subendocardial enhancement as opposed to transmural enhancement of, uh, of late gadolinium. And so after this patient was revascularized, you can see that there was an increase in contractility between diastole and systole. And there was also a reversal in the myocardial thinning uh, from its baseline images over here. Um, contractile reserve with low-dose dobutamine. We use dobutamine 5 to 10 micrograms per kg per minute. Uh, we assume viability is present if there's a greater than 2 millimeter change in wall motion. And when you use uh, wall thickening following revascularization as your gold standard for viability, the sensitivity of this test is 89% and the specificity is 94. Uh, lastly, there's late gadolinium enhancement, and this is what we use uh, most widely. There's an inverse relationship, and that makes sense, uh, between the extent of enhancement and the likelihood of improvement after you've been uh, revascularized. The threshold we use here is 50% uh, or below as viable. If you look at uh, these graphs here, this was looking in, uh, I think, approximately four, 329 patients, uh, all with varying degrees of wall uh, motion abnormalities. And in all comers, past that 50% threshold, there's a less than 10% chance of uh, improvement in contractility uh, once you have more than 50% late gadolinium enhancement. Um, when you look at the presence of viability and and prognosis. There's a, a study that looked at four different groups. Those who were viable and got medical treatment, those who were viable uh, and were completely revascularized, and then those who were non-viable and got either complete revascularization or medical treatment. The group that this ma mattered the most for were those who had viability but were stuck in the medical treatment arm. Uh, looking at this hazard ratio over here, if you had viability, and you were treated with just medical uh, therapy, your risk of death uh, was 4.5 times higher than if you had been revascularized. Uh, contrast that to if you didn't have viability, uh, you still actually did fairly well with just medical treatment and uh, not needing any revascularization. I'm now gonna move on to the non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. This is a, a breadth of different etiologies and will take up uh, most of our time with the, with the MRI. Um, again, going back to this graph, uh, looking for positive or negative late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, if we go down the negative pathway, our cine images can give us a lot of information. They can give us our volume, our EF, morphology. Is this someone who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, LV non-compaction, uh, or ARVC? Um, and I'm going to start with cardiac amyloidosis. So with amyloidosis, we have the deposition of uh, proteins in our extracellular space. Those proteins cause cell toxicity, cell death, and expansion of the extracellular space, which alters the signal intensity in multiple different sequences. And there's two techniques that we look at when we're assessing for amyloidosis in cardiac MRI. Uh, there's late gadolinium enhancement, and then there's also something called T1 
uh, mapping and extracellular volume mapping. Uh, we'll go through each of these. With late gadolinium enhancement, uh, the classic pattern is a diffuse subendocardial enhancement. Uh, there can be mid-myocardial involvement. It can be transmural. If you see transmural, this is often uh, advanced disease with a poor prognosis. There are other clues. Uh, the enhancement may be in a non-vascular distribution. Uh, you can see uh, diffuse hypertrophy of the RV, the LV. You may see enhancement in the RV or in the inner atrial septum, uh, and the presence of a pericardial effusion. All of these could indicate that there's cardiac amyloidosis. However, the absence of late gadolinium enhancement does not mean that you don't have cardiac amyloid. Uh, in addition, cardiac MRI is not able to distinguish between the two types of amyloid, though overall its sensitivity is 85%, specificity is 92%. Um, this is a, I wanted to bring this up because actually at the VA I had a patient who came in with complete heart block uh, and an EF of 40 to 45%. And when we did our cardiac MRI because we suspected that there was some kind of infiltrative process going on, uh, we got back a whole list of differentials, amyloid, sarcoid, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, none of which was too helpful. But the thing that they noted was there was difficulty in nulling the myocardium. Uh, why would that be? Uh, so a null point is where you're trying to look for normal myocardium, and you're using that as your reference point. So that normal myocardium should appear dark. But if you have a diffusely infiltrated cardiomyopathy, it can be very difficult to find that actual null point. Uh, and that's classically found in amyloidosis. Uh, so, as you can see in this picture here, there's not a real clear delineation between our blood pool and our myocardium, and that's because this entire myocardium is really infiltrated with amyloid. Um, as far as prognosis, if you do not have any late gadolinium enhancement, the two-year survival for amyloid is actually pretty good, 92%. Subendocardial enhancement, it drops down to 81%, and if there's transmural involvement for AL amyloid, two-year survival is 45%. For TTR, it's 65%. Uh, parametric mapping is a, is a unique thing for amyloid. Uh, what you're trying to do is actually quantify your T1 time in milliseconds. The higher t your T1 uh, is, the more uh, involvement of amyloid there is in the myocardium. Um, T1 is especially useful because it is more sensitive than late gadolinium enhancement. It can detect disease prior to there even being LVH. Um, and the cutoff here is about 1,044 milliseconds. That cutoff has been shown to be associated with worse prognosis in amyloid patients. Uh, related to T1 mapping is extracellular volume mapping. So you're, you're really looking at that extracellular space, and you're trying to, to isolate it. So you take your pre-contrast images, get your native T1 uh, signal, then you inject contrast, you get your post-contrast signal, and then your your software is going to try to reconstruct the image based on the difference between the contrast of the myocardium and the blood between these two images and create your extracellular volume map. Now, this is a, a normal patient, so you see that there's a clear delineation between your blood pool and your myocardium. Uh, contrast that with someone who has amyloid, and you can see that the blood pool and the myocardium, they kind of start to blend together. And that's because if you have a lot of amyloid, you have a lot of extracellular volume space. So if the extracellular volume space of blood is 60%, and your myocardial wall is 60%, that makes sense why you would have this, this breakdown. Um, and what, it, what extracellular volume mapping is trying to do is trying to quantify the burden of amyloid. So patients who have more than 45% of extracellular volume space, that's associated with a hazard ratio of death of 5.39, at least in our AL subtypes. TTR subtypes, uh, there have been studies that have shown a similar worse prognosis. Um, therefore, T1 mapping and extracellular volume mapping have both diagnostic as well as prognostic implications. Uh, cardiac sarcoidosis, this is a systemic granulomatous inflammatory disease, and when it involves the, the, the heart, the leading cause of death is sudden cardiac death and heart failure. Um, we use a couple of different image sequences to evaluate sarcoid. We use our CINE images, as you saw before, late gadolinium enhancement, and T2-weighted images because uh, with inflammation, such as with sarcoid, uh, there's edema and there's highlighted areas of uh, T2 signal. Cardiac sarcoid is a little bit tricky. It can masquerade as many different types of cardiomyopathies. It could be subendocardial, mimicking ischemia. It could be transmural in a coronary vascular distribution, mimicking uh, infarct. Uh, but it could also be mid-myocardial. It can involve the RV. It can involve patchy segments throughout the myocardium. 
As far as phenotype for the type of heart failure they have, it's usually a dilated cardiomyopathy, but it can be a, it can look like a hypertrophic or an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, but the most common pattern for late gadolinium enhancement is multifocal, mid-myocardial or sub-epicardial enhancement that's usually in the lateral or uh, septal basal segments of the LV. Um, late gadolinium enhancement is used for risk stratification uh, for ventricular or for potentially lethal events such as ventricular arrhythmias or sudden cardiac death. In the 2017 AHA ACC guidelines, there's a class 2A recommendation to implant ACD and ICD in sar cardiac sarcoid patients who have evidence of extensive late gadolinium enhancement on CMR, though what it counts as extensive uh, late gadolinium enhancement is not well defined, even when your EF is greater than 35 percent and provided that you have greater than one year of meaningful survival expected. Um, this was a study that looked at about 150 different patients at a single center. And what they were trying to do was look at people who had systemic sarcoidosis um, and that were later um, evaluated by a cardiac MR. And they were looking at two primary combined endpoints, the first endpoint being a composite of death from any cause, uh, aborted sudden cardiac death from cardioversion or CPR or an appropriate ICD discharge. And endpoint two was looking at the same endpoint there plus the addition of VT or non-sustained VT. Uh, for the first endpoint, people who had late gadolinium enhancement had a hazard ratio of 31.6 of experiencing uh, this composite outcome. Uh, similarly, for endpoint number two, the hazard ratio was 33.9 if they had late gadolinium enhancement. Um, this is a meta-analysis data that kind of hammers in the same point. All-cause mortality in patients who had late gadolinium enhancement with sarcoid had an odds ratio of 3.06 um, in regards to all-cause mortality. And then when you look at the composite outcome, which again includes all-cause mortality, ventricular arrhythmia, ICD shock, or sudden cardiac death, the odds ratio there was 10.74. Um, you can look at annualized event rates for these composite endpoints, uh, of which uh, late gadolinium enhancement also had significantly higher event rates at 11.9% uh, versus just 1.1% in those who did not have late gadolinium enhancement. I'm going to move on next to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a very common genetic cardiomyopathy with potentially as much as 1 in 200 individuals having a mutation in the general population. It's caused by over 1,400 mutations in at least 11 different genes. Um, and these proteins typically encode for the sar sarcomere. Uh, because of so much genetic diversity, there's also a pretty hetero heterogeneous phenotypic expression, including the pattern of LVH. Um, and a subset of these, of these patients will have uh, advanced heart failure, uh, prone to developing atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, thromboembolic events, and sudden cardiac death. Um, these CINA images really can give you a lot of information as far as the phenotype, the mass of the LV, uh, the associated regurgitations, uh, such as with MR. Um, now, ECHO can do all these same things as well and is going to be the first line um, screening tool. Uh, however, uh, there are areas that the echo may not pick up quite as well, echo-blind regions. Um, and these typically are the apex, the inferior septum, and the anterolateral wall. Uh, and these images, if you, have, if you have a clinical suspicion for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, but you have either a non-diagnostic or normal echo, uh, it's advisable to follow up with a cardiac MRI to clarify your diagnosis, because that could pick up these, these regions here that maybe were missed. The diagnostic criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by CMR is a wall thickness greater than or equal to 15 millimeters associated with a non-dilated cavity in the absence of some kind of process that could have caused that uh, level of hypertrophy. Uh, and when you're evaluating the wall thickness, looking at echo, it's possible to overestimate and underestimate your, your wall thickness. Underestimation tends to occur in those same echo blind regions that I was telling you about with the apex, the inferior septum, and the anterolateral wall. Uh, overestimation can occur if you accidentally include structures in the RV. And this has significance because if you have a massively hypertrophied wall, greater than 30 millimeters, that's an independent risk factor for sudden cardiac death and is also a factor in placing an ICD in a patient. Uh, so MRI has the ability to delineate these areas quite clearly so that way that mistake does not happen. Uh, the pattern of distribution most commonly will be the basal anterior free wall. Uh, that goes into the anterior ventricular septum. You can see it in the inferior septum, and uh, there are a lot of different other variations. Uh, 
if you look at the composite of hypertrophy in the uh, anterolateral free wall, the posterior portion of the intraventricular septum, or the apex, that encompasses about 12% of these hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Um, and notably, echo markedly underestimated or did not detect these regions uh, by itself. A subset of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy do develop LV apical aneurysms. Uh, cardiac magnetic resonance has uh, increased sensitivity compared to other uh, imaging modalities in picking this up. It's often associated with a mid cavitary muscular obstruction. And as you notice in this, an in this aneurysm, there's this mild rim of subendocardial enhancement. That's uh, essentially fibrosis, and that is a spot for uh, arrhythmogenic substrate for malignant ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So these patients really do represent a higher risk subset of hypertrophs. The adverse event rate for them is about 6% per year, which is three times normal, three, uh, three times greater than the other part of the HCM cohorts. And uh, this is largely due to sudden death and thromboembolic stroke. And when you see this in a patient, it does raise a couple uh, important management issues. Is this a patient that needs to be uh, anticoagulated for stroke prevention? Is this a patient who we should put in an ICD? Uh, and if they're having recurrent ventricular arrhythmias, is this a patient who we should be aggressive about going for a VT ablation? Um, when you're looking at the outflow tract obstruction in cardiac MR, uh, you, can, you can get the gradient. It's not as good as echo, and so echo is still the more preferred modality in assessing this. Um, but what it can do is give you an idea of the morphology and what's going on that's causing the subaortic obstruction. You know, a third of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients have an elongated mitral valve leaflet, um, and then some have this anomalous insertion of their anterior papillary muscle straight into the mitral valve leaflet. If you see that, that can be helpful for your surgeon because it may modify how they do their myectomy. Um, for instance, for people with this uh, abnormality with the uh, papillary muscle, uh, some surgeons will also uh, thin out that papillary muscle to try and eliminate the obstruction. As far as the pathophysiology of late gadolinium enhancement in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, the blood vessels in the, in the myocardial wall are, are fragile. Um, there's a lot of small vessel disease that leads to microvascular dysfunction. And that leads to ischemia, which then creates dead tissue that's uh, replaced by fibrosis. And as many as 60% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients will have late gadolinium enhancement. The average volume when it's present is 9% of the myocardial volume. The pattern of late gadolinium enhancement in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, is that it's most commonly in both the ventricular septum and the free wall. It's less commonly confined to the apex and areas of RV insertion into the intraventricular septum. There's also a modest relationship between hypertrophy and gadolinium enhancement. Patients who have delayed enhancement usually have greater LV wall thickness and greater LV mass index than those without gadolinium enhancement. Uh, but the most important part about this is really the, again, prognosis for sudden cardiac death. Uh, as I said, about 60% of patients have late gadolinium enhancement, so a binary decision of do they have it or do they not is not very helpful in deciding if this is someone who's at risk for sudden cardiac death. Instead, if you look at the extent of the mass that's um, involved, greater than 15%, you can see that there's a two-fold increase in sudden cardiac event risk, which is estimated to be 6% uh, at five years. The extent of late gadolinium enhancement also predicted the development of end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with systolic dysfunction. So if you tie it all together, uh, going down this flow chart, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if they didn't sustain uh, VT or had a sudden cardiac arrest that they survived, no family history of sudden cardiac, sudden cardiac death or wall thickness greater than 30, you get to this part of the flow chart where if they have non-sustained VT or an abnormal blood pressure response to exercise, you look at their risk modifications, and that's where CMR really highlights those risks. Uh, if there's the presence and extent of late gadolinium enhancement greater than 15%, that can push you to get an ICD. If the EF is less than 50%, it pushes you to get an ICD. And the uh, high-risk subset of apical aneurysms also pushes you to potentially get an ICD. Um, this is, a, is an interesting find. Uh, iron overload states, haven't seen this too often, but it actually has uh, major implications with cardiac MR. Uh, iron overload can occur between two distinct mechanisms. Either you have a disruption in your iron regulation through some genetic mechanism where there's excess GI absorption. That's typically a slow process, and uh, patients won't present with symptoms until middle age. Uh, 
or you have transfusional overload because of some um, hemoglobinopathy, and these usually accumulate much faster and present much earlier. Uh, the most common pathology, though, is thalassemia major, where there's an uh, absence of a beta globin gene in your hemoglobin A. Uh, these patients don't have effective erythropoiesis, and by two years, they have lightning or life-threatening uh, anemia and require lifelong transfusions. Other hemoglobinopathies can do this as well, sickle cell, um, thalassemia minor, diamond black fan. And the natural history for these patients is that they will go for a long asymptomatic phase uh, with progressive myocardial accumulation, and then suddenly there's an onset of malignant arrhythmias or cardiac dysfunction. And once that happens, there's a significant mortality associated with it, five-year survival of 48%. Uh, so what cardiac MRI can do is you can look at a sequence called your T2 star. Uh, this does not require any contrast. It's similar to T2 relaxation, except it takes, in, takes into account your local magnetic field, which is inhomogeneous. And if you have a bunch of iron in your myocardium, that speeds up this T2 star relaxation, creating a brighter signal. Um, and the cardiac MRI can then quantify that magnitude of iron deposition. So if you take your myocardium, you look at your interventricular septum, you use your T2 star sequence, and you calculate how long it takes uh, to reach 37% of re relaxation. Uh, patients who have less than 10 milliseconds are at high risk of developing heart failure and need chelation therapy. Those who are greater than 20 milliseconds, those are low risk. Um, and you can do serial exams with this. Once you start chelation therapy, you can monitor to see if you need to adjust uh, their dose and see if they're actually responding to the therapy and having a higher T2 star. Uh, next, we have left ventricular non-compaction. This is a cardiomyopathy that is uh, characterized by prominent trabeculations with deep intratrabecular recesses and a compact and non-compact layer to the myocardium. Most of the time, it's a dilated phenotype with a, a big LVA cavity, reduced EF, and eccentric hypertrophy. Uh, clinical presentation can be varied. It can go from asymptomatic to heart failure with malignant arrhythmias and thromboembolic events. Um, your balanced uh, steady state free processions and images can give you a good idea of the delineation between the tight, packed myocardium and this uh, non compacted myocardium. The diagnosis is based on a ratio of the non compacted to compacted myocardium of greater than 2.3 at end diastole. And that's what you see in this figure here. Here is the blue line, that's your compacted myocardium, and this uh, orange red line is your uh, non compact myocardium. You can find some supporting findings, including a thin myocardial layer, um, as well as abnormal systolic function for LV non-compaction. When you look at late gadolinium enhancement with non-compaction, uh, you'll note that the non-compacted segments typically involve a different wall area than where you find gadolinium enhancement. Gadolinium enhancement is seen in about 55% of patients, and its presence and extent do correlate with the level of LV dysfunction, as well as how dilated the LV is. Um, as far as prognosis, so uh, in this study of 113 patients with, um, with non-compaction, 11 patients showed late gadolinium enhancement. But in that subset, these patients had a fourfold increase in experiencing a cardiac event. A cardiac event was defined as um, malignant cardiac arrhythmia or a thromboembolic event. Uh, so that establishes gadolinium enhancement as a real independent predictor of poor prognosis for these patients. Uh, Patients who also had di dilated cardiomyopathy-like features, meaning a high diastolic volume, low stroke volume, or decreased EF, also carried a poor prognosis. So those without any of those features actually did pretty well. They didn't experience any cardiac events over four years. Uh, this is helpful to keep in mind when you're making choices on your non-compaction patients. Do they need an ICD? Should we put them on warfarin for stroke prophylaxis? Um, and notably, the degree of hypertrabeculation does not affect your prognosis. Uh, next, I have uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. This is a heritable heart muscle disease characterized by fibro fatty replacement in the RV, which can lead to potentially life-threatening arrhythmias um, and right ventricular dysfunction. A majority of the mutations occur in the cardiac desmosome, which is the protein that really links cardiac myocytes together. So the histology here, you can see that this is nice, tightly packed myocardium. Here in ARVC, we have fibro fatty replacement of, uh, of the right ventricle. Uh, on cardiac MRI, it's, a, it's still a diagnostic challenge 
for these patients. And the normal RV has a variable shape and contraction patterns, so detecting early subtle disease is very difficult. In addition, the prevalence of the disease is very low, so operator experience in identifying it is also uh, makes it difficult. Despite this, cardiac MRI is still the best non-invasive test for ARVC diagnosis and also to distinguish it from other uh, cardiomyopathies. There is task force criteria for ARVC. Uh, these were last updated in 2010. They, they incorporate a range of major and minor criteria from structural, histologic, electrocardiographic, arrhythmia, and family history. Um, and then for a definite diagnosis, you need either two major criteria, one major or two minor, or four minor criteria. As far as cardiac MRI is concerned, the major criteria relate to finding a regional wall motion abnormality in the RV, as well as a dilated RV um, or a decreased ejection fraction in the RV. These criteria have a sensitivity of 68 to 76% and a specificity of 95%. Minor criteria are similar. They're just more relaxed with their level of, um, of dilation, uh, as well as relaxed on their level of uh, EF dysfunction. Uh, the sensitivity naturally does increase when you do this from 79 to 89%, but at the cost of lowering your specificity, it's usually more closer to that 85% range. Uh, these are some cine images of ARVC. Uh, from here, you can get a sense of just how dilated the RV is. You can see areas of, if you look on this one here, there's that little bulge that occurs there, uh, and that is part of the regional wall motion abnormalities that we see with uh, ARVC. Um, and those wall motion abnormalities are among the earliest and most reliable abnormalities identified by cardiac MRI. You can see a global reduction in your RV. You can see these subtle regions of these little microaneurysms along the base, um, these focal wall segment abnormalities. Uh, in addition, there's something called the accordion sign. You look at this mid-cavitary space here, and it kind of has this crinkly-looking appearance like an accordion. Uh, that, too, is representative of a small region of highly localized myocardium with desynchronous contraction. Um, and in terms of late gadolinium enhancement, uh, it's seen in up to 88% of ARVC, but it is not part of the task force criteria for diagnosis. The reason for this is that the RV myocardium is already pretty thin, and detection can sometimes be difficult. In addition, that gets exacerbated by ARVC, where the uh, wall thinning can be even more pronounced. Um, as far as fibro fatty replacement and looking for that on MRI, this is actually a source for misdiagnosis. So while it is classic in, in pathology, uh, we have studies showing that even when experienced readers are looking at these cardiac MRI images, they're not able to detect uh, intramyocardial fat uh, reliably. Uh, so because this replacement, replacement of myocardial fat is not specific for ARVC on MRI, uh, it is really not a a parameter that we can use to, to diagnose ARVC. Um, risk stratification, uh, the most important decision once you've diagnosed ARVC is whether or not this patient needs an ICD uh, for prevention of sudden cardiac death. For those who have sustained VT, the decision is easy. They need an ICD. But in those who have no prior ventricular arrhythmia, the decision is a little bit more ambiguous. As far as cardiac MRI is concerned, um, if you have a normal cardiac MRI, uh, that has a high negative predictive value for a sustained ventricular arrhythmia, and this is among a population of patients who have at least a mutation for ARVC as a carrier. Uh, of course, if you have abnormalities on the, on the cardiac MRI, this thing confers a higher risk, but most of the time, there's a, a change in your electrical abnormalities, either by EKG or Holter, prior to there being any change in, that is detectable by cardiac MRI. Uh, last entity we're gonna talk about is myocarditis. Myocarditis is an acute or chronic inflammatory disease of the myocardium. Its etiologies can be viral, toxic, or autoimmune. Um, and it's, and in, in this case, cardiac MRI is the most useful non-invasive tool to assess for myocarditis. We look at T2 sequences, perfusion images, uh, late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and like I said before, T2 images are bright with water. And so when you have inflammation leading to edema, you get these areas of uh, enhancement in the myocardium. In addition, you can assess myocarditis by perfusion imaging. Uh, so you give gadolinium, uh, you image the patient 20 seconds, three minutes after you inject, and then what you mainly see is an increase in uptake, and that's largely due to inflammatory hyperemia causing increased flow into that part of the myocardium. The late gadolinium enhancement that you see by myocarditis 
uh, is typically going to be subepicardial or mid myocardial. Uh, it usually spares a subendocardium, so it doesn't look like ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, these bright areas are either um, acute necrosis or chronic and representative of scar. There are specific criteria for diagnosing myocarditis by MRI. These are the Lake Louise criteria. You need at least two out of three to make the diagnosis. And they all relate to the images that we were talking about. T2 images looking for increased edema, uh, early perfusion imaging looking for increased early gadolinium enhancement, and then looking for the distribution of late gadolinium enhancement uh, in a non-vascular territory. Sensitivity of these criteria when two out of three are met is 67%, and the specificity is about 91%. Um, in isolation, gadolinium enhancement is the most sensitive parameter, but it lacks specificity. Uh, if you see a pericardial effusion or if there's LV dysfunction, that's also supportive evidence for myocarditis. There are parameters on when to repeat the cardiac MRI. If the patient presented early and the initial exam was normal, but the onset of symptoms and the clinical evidence still seems to indicate myocarditis, it's worth repeating that MRI in one to two weeks. If one or two, if only one criteria is present at the time of diagnosis, repeating it in one to two weeks is also advised. So, summary and conclusion, cardiac MRI with late gadolinium enhancement is the cornerstone in differentiating ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Uh, cardiac MRI is an accurate tool for the assessment of viability and can identify patients who would stand to benefit from revascularization. Um, and then various non-ischemic cardiomyopathies uh, cardiac MRI can deliver both diagnostic and prognostic information that's helpful in the management of these patients. These are my references, and at this time I'll take any questions. There's a lot of uh, chronic total occlusion interest in coronary disease with symptomatic patients, probably right. trigger it, but. Uh, Chronic total occlusions in asymptomatic patients, how, how much uh, this kind of looking with MRI is going on or should be going on? I, I'll, I'll ask these guys as well as you. Sure. Um, I but you show the marked difference in, in, in whatever study that was you were showing, uh, depending on viability. Correct. Uh, and that, that holds for chronic total occlusions, too. There have been studies looking at CTOs and using cardiac MRI. Um, again, if you have tissue that's dead, greater than 50% over there, uh, opening up a chronic total occlusion may not make much sense if you're looking to improve function. Um, though as far as symptoms, I'm not really sure what the studies would say about that in reference to cardiac MRI helping with stratification for that. So in the chronic total occlusion, for example, the right, and uh, if there are Q waves on the EKG, so it makes you wonder about opening that vessel. Uh, you know, MRI might add something to that. Uh, you know, do the Q waves mean that there's a thin myocardium like some of the things that you showed or what? And is, in an asymptomatic person, I mean, should, should you pursue that? Uh, I don't know the answer to that either. You could say, well, maybe, maybe like Andreas used to say, it's better to have an open vessel than a closed vessel because <laughs> somewhere down the line there's uh, this collateral flow. I, I don't know if that's been done. It probably has been done. I would have to look. I didn't yeah. look into that specifically. Always makes me wonder about that. And you know, we uh, well, I mean, you can, you. you can I don't know whether they're doing it or not. But uh, you know, the other day you worked on a patient of <laughs> mine that made her clinically better, that had inferior Q waves. We worked on her right for 20 years, and, uh, you know, we restated her right. She's clinically better, and, uh, you know, objectively, I, I don't think we have the evidence that, uh, that we did something beneficial to the myocardium in that area, so sure. maybe those are questions that are yet to be answered. It's very good, huh, Keith? Thank you. Can you comment on the, uh, the cost? You know, is, uh, how does the cost compare to like an echo? Right. So cost is obviously more. Um, so that's why you would use it in select types of patients. You know, if you are not getting the answer you need from your echo, then a cardiac MRI is reasonable. Uh, 
Uh, if you are looking for lots of information and you want a one-stop shop to get all that information, a cardiac MRI is very helpful. Um, so especially if you're looking at stress perfusion imaging, but you also want to look at viability because you have, say, an ischemic cardiomyopathy um, with low EF and you're wondering, well, first of all, is there an ischemia? And second of all, is there already just too much scar to open up this, this area? Uh, a cardiac MRI would be great to just get all that information out at once. Um, but if you're looking at just, you know, one question type deals, then so, uh, other modalities are going to be cheaper to do that. Idea. I don't have a, a number. There's, uh, <laughs> there's a marked difference in what we bill the patients and what the insurance company will pay. For example, I had a patient the other day that uh, needed an MRI of her back. Yeah. So uh, if you ask me off the cuff what that cost, I would say eight grand. So we didn't, we couldn't get her an hour. So she goes over to a little open our MRI place on Piedmont. And uh, they said, well, we can do it today or tomorrow. And uh, she said, well, uh, if you can do that, I'll, I'll pay cash because we can't pre-search something like that. And they said, oh, well, in that case, it'll be, if you'll pay four fifty, we'll do it for you. So there's a lot of funny things going on. And that's almost a loaded question. Uh, question. How much does it cost? The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.